The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. This is an opinion-based program. In 2024, tonight, with the resounding victory of President Gotabe Rajapaksa, the need for a stable government has come to the foray where Martha is calling for the proper legislature to ensure that the president can deliver on what he promised. Is the 21st and the 22nd amendments to the constitution such piece of legislature aimed at supporting in providing a steady path to the president's need in getting the job done? The bill to be tabled as a private member's bill by parliamentarian Vijay Dasa Rajpaksa seeks to reinstate the threshold for minority parties to qualify to enter parliament to the original rate of 12.5%. In recent history, party politics aligned with ethnicities has played a key role in destabilizing previous governments when the majority had to seek the support of the minority parties to push certain legislature. That resulted in the main parties bowing down to the whims and needs of the minority parties while sacrificing the very mandate given by the people. Can we return to politics through policies rather than politics through communal divisions? For insight and analysis of what the 21st and 22nd amendments to the constitution can do for the country, Tonight, I've invited the architect of the said proposed legislature, Member of Parliament and President's Councillor, Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa. Welcome to Monday. It's time to get real. A very good evening and welcome to the program. Thank you very much for joining me this week as well. Our focus tonight is on the newly proposed 21st and 22nd amendments to the Constitution. Will these amendments make or break the future of our governing process? Let's get real. Well, in my opening statement tonight, Colombo liberals are going crazy these days. What's their topic of discussion? It's whether Iraj is suitable for a director position at the Tourism Promotion Bureau. Let's just face it, he's more than capable and qualified for that position. After all, the only thing he's good at is promoting. He was not appointed as the Secretary to the Treasury. Let's not forget the Liberal nomination for President. He was utterly not qualified. Just a mere image pumped up by certain members of our society. Not my words is the words of a so-called member of your own party. Look it up. Now let's talk something that really matters. Now for some time, the understanding has been, you scratch my back and I'll take everything. That's not the usual saying, but apparently that's exactly what has been happening since 1994 in our nation's parliament. Creating a stable government has always been a daunting task, as none of the major parties who secure the most number of seats in elections can take the required two-thirds majority thanks to our election process. The majority of this country votes to power either the United National Party or the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, which has now undergone various versions of itself. The current uh, Sri Lanka Podhijana Peramuna, one such example. So since 1994, despite the majority of the country voting for either these two parties, what has been happening is that according to our election laws, none of the main parties can get the required majority to put their vision into action through a stable government. Now, this is very evident since 1994. Then President Chandrika Kumarathunga won the presidential election at a rate of 62.28%. Uh, but in the general election, her party only managed to secure 105 seats in parliament, forcing them to bank on the support of parties like EPDP and the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress. Parties merely formed to be beneficial to certain ethnic groups. Now, if you remember right, there were so many issues within that government not being able to run the country as all these minority parties were forcing the government to act according to their tunes. Now, it's that vital that our country needs a stable government. That's the only way we can go forward. And I believe that as long as we continue to fight for the better version of this country through ethnic lines, then we've lost the plot even before the game began. 
The 2019 presidential election gave a clear message by the people of this country to the so-called leaders of this country, showing them how the people want this country to be governed. Despite all the mudslinging and the BS by the good governance, what we saw was that the people selected a man who stood for that what the future of this country can become. Slowly, he's getting us there. So it's high time that we think of a mechanism that would help this man to run this country according to the promises that he made prior to the presidential election. This is where a stable government comes to play. As long as we can create that environment without pulling our governing system based on our ethnicities, then I think the real reconciliation the country seeks can be found and we all, each and every one of us, can flourish. අපි දැනගන්න කැමති ආණ්ඩුවෙන් හරියට පැහැදිලි කිරීමක් මේ 21 සහ 22 සංශෝධන දෙක හුදෙක් විජේදාස රාජපක්ෂ මන්ත්‍රීවරයාගේ පෞද්ගලික උමනාවක්ද එසේ නොමැති නම් මෙය රජයේ ප්‍රතිපත්තියක් විදිහට ගෙනෙනු ලබන ව්‍යවස්ථා සංශෝධන දෙකක්ද අපි දකින්නේ මේක හුදෙක්ම ගෝත්‍රික පන්නේ ව්‍යවස්ථා ප්‍රතිසංස්කරණය පක්ෂයක් හැටියට අපි කණ්ඩායමක් හැටියට බලලා තමයි මේක ක්‍රියාවට නගන්න නැත්නම් විජේදාස රාජපක්ෂ මැතිතුමා ගෙනාවට රටක් වෙනුවෙන් ගන්න ඕන තීන්දුවක් ගන්නකොට දීර්ඝ සාකච්ඡාවක් කරලා ඒක තීන්දුවක් ගන්න जनताधिपत्यूर्ण Let's take a short commercial break right now. After that, I will sit down with a member of parliament, Dr. Vijay Dasar Rajpaksa, who is the architect of the 21st and 22nd amendments to the constitution, to discuss as uh, what he hopes to do. This is Get Real. I'll be right back. Time to get into the discussion portion of our program tonight, and tonight I have invited uh, one of the senior members uh, in our political field, Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajpaksa, who is a member of Parliament and who has uh, held many positions in various cabinets uh, since. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> well, quite a lot of time yeah. in your political uh, arena. Welcome uh, to the show, sir. Th this is the first time I'm actually uh, seeing you on this show, and th I, I need to thank you for accepting my invitation and coming on board. And a very happy new year to you. Same to you. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, so we are talking about um, the 21st and the 22nd Amendment. This is the point of our conversation um, tonight. Um, if we, we've heard about the 19th Amendment, that has been going on extensively. We've been talking, we are still talking about it. Uh, not so much about the 20th Amendment. Now here we see, we are hearing about the 21st and the 22nd. What's, what's, the, what's the process here? 20th Amendment, of course, that was introduced by the JVP, but that had been almost uh, rejected, not only by the parliamentarians, even by our society. Though it was presented by that particular political party, it was brought for the purpose of just to accommodate one person in the parliament in that political hierarchy during that period. Mm -hmm. That is why that people have ignored it and there is no purpose. But 21st amendment that I have proposed is somewhat different. Mm -hmm. Explain to us, sir. Yes. You know, this is, this is only a medicine, but diagnosis is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, in our country, the communal politics has been the most significant obstacle in many spheres in, in the country. Mm -hmm. Whether it is political, social, cultural, religious, language, everywhere, this uh, communal politics has been, you know, uh, it has uh, spread its tentacles and everybody is caught up with this kind of politics. 
that is the problem where as to why that we cannot go forward in fact that if you look at the history uh, one british academic mm -hmm. jane russell dr jane russell has done a phd research in the university of peradeniya and she has published her research under the title of communal politics under the donomo constitution mm -hmm. in ceylon though that british empire had over 60 countries under his domination they have never introduced when they introduced the democracy to various you know the colonies under their regime they never introduced any political system based on community mm -hmm. that had, has happened only in sri lanka not even in india no way in any part of the world the when, when they introduced that donomo constitution then they they allocated seats for up country singalis low country singalis mm -hmm. yes. tamils muslims you know that as a, as as a result of that one although that we had got the dominion status so called independence in 1948 but in political arena there was no any unity why that they had trained our mind based on communal communal you know the politics as a result when we got the dominion status in 48 by the even before that the tamils in the northern mm -hmm. that they had formed the political party that federal party the federal means itself is some division indeed and that is purely for tamils then where is the democracy only democracy was given to the rest of the people in the country now that communal politics has created a problem that was the beginning of you know this uh, horrendous war that continued for over three decades in sri lanka that was the beginning that is communal politics in uh, 1976 the opposition lead, leader then amir uh, amir talinga is the one who declared a separate country in wadukode and handed over the entire destiny of the tamil people to prabakaran he was a terrorist then he as as a result what he did he he destroyed all the powerful political figures in his community that is terrorism indeed and now what has happened now there is another that there is another extension that is happened during the period of president ranasinghe premadasa in 1988 the election was fixed for 19th of december he was the candidate by the time he was the prime minister of the country also they had the they had the majority in the parliament at the request of a minority party leader purely for the purpose of getting advantage that is the votes of muslim community then he agreed to amend the constitution president jr jawadana in 1978 while introducing the new constitution which is a uh, almost like the same in the de gaulle's constitution in france the main object was just to have a stable parliament and a powerful president for that just befitting to that stable system together with the presidency executive presidency then he introduced this uh, pr system proportional representation this is system the, this is the 15th amendment no that is that is main constitution original constitution this is in 78 yes uh -huh. both electoral system and the executive presidency were introduced in the 78. original constitution for any political party or independent group to achieve that they are target just to get uh, get a seat in a particular electoral district that contesting political party or the independent group has to get minimum 12.5% of the valid vote that is Indeed. the threshold limit that was what was there that's right 
that 12.5 percent was reduced to 5 percent just two days before the election, December 17th in 1988. Then most of the people are not aware, the people of this country were not aware what was happening in the parliament because that the election was going on. That was during the insurgency, JVP, mm -hmm. or everywhere the dead bodies and killings, like a war, the, like a you know war field here. Indeed. Then nobody knew. There was no any dialogue. Even the members who had raised their hands were not aware what is the repercussions of this thing, and they reduce it to five percent. If it is reduced into five percent and accommodate into you know small political parties based on the uh, democratic form of policies, one can't object. That is one way good. But it didn't happen in Sri Lanka. As a result, the first election was conducted in 89, just after the presidential election. It is not significant because some people with 200, 300 mm -hmm. votes also came to the parliament mm -hmm. during the insurgency and the terrorist war. But thereafter, fair election was conducted only in 1994. Ms. Chandrika Bandaranayaka, she got 62% popular votes. But she couldn't get 113 seats in the parliament. Yeah. She couldn't run the government. It was a minority government. That, then what happened was, then he, she had to get the support of the Muslim Congress, where the Muslim Congress leader, who, the person who was responsible in getting this mm -hmm. 15th amendment passed, uh, through the through President Premadasa, then they joined the government. Then thereafter, since 1994, except for 2010, you know, with the war victory, uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa at that time, he got 144 votes. Except that, no political party could have ever got, except that occasion, 113 seats. Then every time we get, you know, somewhere around 100 to 110, both parties, either party, then they'll have to go behind a small political party formed on the basis of communal lines. Indeed. Then they, there are so many demands that they need, you know, so many ministries, whether they are around 5 or 10 in number, immaterial. The best example in 2015 when we formed that so-called Yahapalane, where I myself was <laughs> in, in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. But I had to fight alone on my own against all these, you know, the corruptions and uh, other illegal activities. You know, even then, the Muslim Congress joined our, our party just eight days before the election. And the other Muslim party, they joined two weeks before the election. But once we formed the government, we had only 106, so we needed their support. They demanded, whatever the ministry they demanded, everything was given. Without any? Without any reservation. Even when uh, Richard Baduddin wanted about 47 institutions, in, in, under his portfolio, everything was given. Now, now that people, when the people also looking at as to how they are conducting themselves, mm -hmm in the political field. There are a lot of, you know, that's animosity and ang angry, you know, the developing among the communities. In addition to that, they, everything was, you know, based on communal line. I don't think that we have a future if we have to continue like this. That is why that I introduced the best system under the executive presidency and the PR system President Yair Jawad then decided that 12.5 percent is the most appropriate uh, cut-off mark. So you're you're suggesting that let's get back to the original number. Exactly. It's not like a, a new number or anything. No, though. no. This is what we've been doing for some time. Yeah, that was, in fact, that under that system there was election only once in 1989, just after this uh, amendment, I, but. I told you that was not significant because yes. it was haphazardly done election. But throughout that this has become a stumbling block 
that no stable parliament, that whatever the minority political party demands, you will have to comply, you will have to satisfy them, not the people. The opposition to this particular bill that you are proposing, they say that when you bring this particular bill and when we move the threshold to 12.5 percent, the people, the minority, uh, not the parties, let's say the minority communities within the country, their issues will not be addressed because at the end of the day, the majority will, uh, you know, whitewash every single thing. So how, how, how do you address that? What, what is your response to You that? know, their issues started with this communal politics. Before these small political parties were established, all the Muslim politicians, as well as Tamil politicians, that they were in the they were big figures in both political parties. Yeah, indeed. You yeah. remember Tondaman and Tondaman, then that is that up country Tamil people were represented. Then Shahul Hamid, M H yes. Mohammed, then Baduddin Mahamud, the former Minister of uh, Education. There are so many in both political parties. Kumar Surya, all were very powerful national figures. Now, as it is that no Muslim, neither Muslim nor Tamil, will get a chance to go to the top of main political parties. Because these communal based political parties, as they have made their, you know, the mind set up the, their community people in a such a way that, you know, the Muslims or Tamils who will come from the main parties are not getting the support. Therefore, in fact, that is, that is the main disadvantage for the minority people. Mm -hmm. What I am trying to, I am trying to, you know, that restore their rights and dignity, which prevail prior to the establishment of these minority political parties. We see this uh, in the United States. We see it's a two-party system. Uh, the main party do uh, represent from various communities within the United States, That's whether right. it's a Latino community, the indigenous community, anywhere. So the, the people are there in that particular party. Uh, do you see that is the best way forward uh, going from the... You know, that is the meaning of democracy. Now you look at not only USA, that uh, Barack Obama could become the president of that country. Black person. Being a black person where that population is less than 20%. You look at uh, UK, of course, is somewhat different. Basically, that's white people are there. But you take India, a lot of diversities. So many, you know, that provinces, federal provinces, Indeed. about 28 and 22 official languages. But they are, they are divided on political party lines. The Congress, Bharatiya Janata, there are some other small parties also. But in a country like India, Abdul Kalam, where the Muslim population is less than 12 percent, mm -hmm. became he became the president. president. Then uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Narasing, sorry, not, not, not Narasing Rao, the last Prime Minister. Uh, no, Vajpayee, uh, yes, Manmohan Singh. Manmohan Singh. There you know that she community is less than 4 percent in India. But all the whole India welcome him. No? Now the presently, uh, the president is a Buddhist. Buddhist population is not even one person in India. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they are division based on political democracy, debates. political policies. But ours that we are divided by, you know, just because of your identity as a in a, in a community. Doctor, uh, one key thing that you just raised uh, just got my attention. Uh, uh, in the 2015 election, you said that uh, certain parties, when they wanted to support uh, then candidate, um, uh, former President Maitri Palasi, you saying as a uh, candidacy, um, everything was given. Uh, anything what they asked was That's, given. Yeah. That is absolutely reckless and puts this entire country into danger because if that, if by any chance if there were nefarious uh, agendas that was at play, mm -hmm. we, our whole system is going to fall apart and we are just going to be sh in shambles. That was a disaster. That is why the whole country is now suffering. That paved the way even up to the, up to the biggest calamity that happened in this country, that is the Easter Sunday attack. That is the basis. They got too much of power. Minority parties were dominating the government. 
although we got about 100, over 100 the members in the parliament representing the United National Party, they, that we had no any say. They were dominating. And when the, I, of course, 30 months before this uh, blast, I revealed this fact in the parliament in 2016 November that they are getting ready with the ISIS support, ISIS trained people. Of course, at that time, there were 32 persons involved in that terrorist activities. And when there was an investigation on the, on the image the Buddha statutes and uh, the Jesus statutes in uh, Mavanel and in that, around that area, um, some of those suspects have been taken into police custody without, without producing them before the magistrate that they have been released purely due to the pressure came from the political leaders. We, we even saw that uh, Saharan. That's right. Uh, was taken into custody yeah. prior and then was released uh, based on political pressure. Uh, Who protected them? How they were, you know, that dis disregarding the court warrants, how they were living in the society? Who, who gave the protection? This is the party leaders. That is the danger. So, so your suggestion is let's curtail this... Um, uh, in a way, a dictatorship from the minority parties controlling the majority. Uh, you said that if by any chance, if all these minority parties come and join the major parties, that they would actually have a voice. What is the guarantee? Because at the end of the day, we know that we are coming out for a, from a 30-year conflict and the, and the Tamil people's mind is brainwashed. Uh, they see the Sinhalese community, uh, not now, but it, it has improved. But, you know, the, at, at one particular time in areas like in Mulathi, in Kilinochi, they don't even know what the Sinhalese uh, culture is. They think that it's quite drastically different from their own, whereas we are just actually similar to each other. So, what do you see? How can we move forward with this? Do you think, because we need to get the people's mindset changed. That's when the leaders uh, will change if the people say, because that's what we saw in uh, 2019 uh, presidential election, people said. So how can we get, go there with your proposal and tell them, you look know, here. The demolition of the Berlin Wall was not that difficult, but changing the mindset of the people, the attitude of the people uh, is very, you know, difficult, tiring <laughs> task. <laughs> Indeed. But still, you have to do it prior to 1948, the Tamil political leaders, not the Tamil people, the people are not communal minded. Political leaders are the problem. They made that made the attitude of the Tamil people in such a way that they started looking at all the Sinhalese mm -hmm. as any enemies. Exactly. They that is that they have to do it if they have to have the control in their area. Sure. and to get the votes of the people. Then that only the uh, Tamil, Tamil community was, you know, that isolated uh, after 1948 mm -hmm. and continued for some, still that has been continued. That is the reason, you know, the distrust, the mistrust, that there is no any association. They, they are, we are not mingling with the Tamil people. No opportunity, no chance is given. And the political leaders prevent that. That is as a result that we went through that 30 year old war. Now, what happened to the Muslim community? That started in 1988. Prior to that, nothing. Any Muslim recognized Muslim could have won any single electorate without any problem. Yes, we, we've seen that in- We have seen that, that is our experience. But now can you do that? Why? The minority political party leaders, they don't want that their community think in a democratic uh, manner. They just wanted, they, they just want to keep them, you know, isolated. Then the people that, minority people, they don't get a chance to mix up in political, mm -hmm. uh, in the political culture with the major political parties. And as a result that they never get a chance to come to the the highest level of the main political parties, the so-called that's you know the national leadership. Uh, it is it's been prevented by these minority political parties, 
as a result that in fact that much more than the uh, the Sinhalese community that minority communities are suffering. Why is that? Whether it, the suffering is by the majority or the minority is not an issue. But how can we reform this? How can we develop this country? How can we go forward with these obstacles? Indeed. Um, that's but uh, my, 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 you know, that attempt is just to get the minority people in the main yeah. political yeah. parties and to get them, you know, to become, for them to become prominent figures and real national leaders, that is good for all the communities. Then only that you can have the reconciliation just because that you have appointed a minister for reconciliation or an office in that World Trade Center for the reconciliation. Have you seen any reconciliation during the last so many years in this country? Nothing. Everything is worsened. Indeed, uh, that's actually a very good point to take a short commercial break. You're watching uh, Get Real. I'm in conversation with Dr. Vijayasa Rajpaksa. We'll be on that status. to the program. Uh, you're watching Get Real and I'm in conversation with Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksha, uh, Member of Parliament. Uh, with regard to his proposal, uh, a private member bill that he is uh, going to put forward, the 21st and the 22nd Amendment. Uh, we actually spoke about the 21st Amendment uh, that you're proposing. What's the 22nd? 22nd is just to remove some obstacle on the president to appoint the judges to the superior courts and to appoint the high top uh, public officers such as attorney general, uh, then inspector general of police, secretary general of parliament, ombudsman, the auditor general, like that. This was uh, this particular power was removed by the 19th amendment. 19th amendment that powers had been uh, that discretion had been curtailed by the condition that unless there is a approval by the Constitutional Council that the President has no power to make those appointments. I want to take such appointments out of the control of the Constitutional Council because that was the worst politicized institution in our country at the moment. I myself has witnessed, I have witnessed enough. I was there more than one, two years as a member of the Constitutional Council representing the government. Where that I saw the government of the UNP, government of the UNP, where I saw that 90% appointments were, you know, the approval was given only on the political lines, only for their supporters and loyalists. Even when we wanted to appoint a competent uh, senior DIG as the Inspector General of Police, purely on political basis, the loyalty basis that they appointed that particular uh, inspector general of police that who could prevent even the Easter Sunday attack while having all the information in his hands more than two weeks. Indeed. And there were a lot of injustice caused to the judges as far as their promotions are concerned. One lady judge had to retire because her promotion was denied. She has written a judgment against one of the ministers previously. One particular judge was denied her promotion to the court of appeal because that he has, she has granted bail to one of the suspect that who was involved in the previous guard. That is the, you know, the pity conduct of that constitutional council. So you, you, you're suggesting let's get back to what we did before. That, that has to be because you will have to look at these issues comparatively, whereas that there was no any injustice that much uh, during the period where president was ex exercising his discretion. Mm -hmm. Now, there was an allegation against the president Mahindra Rajapaksa about the removal of the chief justice yes. uh, Bandaranaika. Uh, we were fighting in that uh, against that move 
I was the president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka at that time. That there was a big, you know, the voice that was debated. They had the whole country had a big dialogue on it. Mm -hmm. But very schemingly, that judges have been denied their promotion, due promotions, had, and they have been uh, sent home by the Constitutional Council. The Who talks? That is only about one judge. Here, about dozens of judges. Mm -hmm. The promotion of judges is quite uh, in the in, in the public sphere right now because of those uh, leaked uh, audio conversations with Parliament in Ranjan Ramanaike. There also we saw one particular um, judge, uh, a lady judge, who was very frustrated with regard to her position, and she wanted to get some support from a junior mi um, minister to go up the ladder. Go up the ladder. Um, I want to get uh, some reaction on that, but later on. But uh, one of the opposition, uh, particularly the the JVP. The JVP says that uh, the reason you're bringing these two amendments uh, is based on the fact that you want to get uh, closer, if I may use that word, uh, with the current president. What's your response to that? Uh, that is the, you know, the, the childish thinking of that particular political party. When I was offered the ministerial post by this, uh, the present president and the prime minister, I would deny it. They refuse. Even Mrs. Chandrika Bandaranayaka in 2004, when I was appointed from the national list, I was offered the cabinet piece. I refused that. I have refused the portfolios three times now. One time I have resigned. One time I have been removed. <laughs> I am the least bothered person about this membership of the parliament and the uh, ministerial portfolio. But while being in the cabinet, you know, from the beginning of that last government, I had to fight within the cabinet. If you I wanted to remain, if I wanted to remain in the cabinet, I could have waited, keeping my lips tight, like all the other politicians did. But JVP, of course, that they, they, they may say that due to their frustration, because that this amendment will not affect them. For the reason that if you look at the last presidential election result, the maximum seats that they can get only Two, that is the maximum. Only one is really secured. If at all, that they can go up to two. And district wise, not a single seat. And the KVP, of course, that they are they are criticizing with all kinds of you know hatred and jealousy. They are creating among the minds of the people. That is the only thing they can do also. But you look at the JVP. In 2004, I was instrumental in forming that uh, uh, Exat Janatani Das Handane. UPFA. UPFA. I drafted the constitution. I drafted the agreement in between SLAP and the JVP. And they just joined us. And they got 39 seats. Yes. The parliament. Then, you know, they were under the impression that people have recognized the them JVP. in such a big way. And they started threatening our government. Tandrika Bandar Naik on the PTO. Then they resigned from the government. What happened? Then 2005, the election came for the presidency. Then they joined Mahindra Rajapaksha. <laughs> then uh, in 2010, then they joined us again. And for the presidency of uh, Sarat Field Marshal Sarat Fonseca, they were on that stage. Then 2015, you look at. In 2010, they were on the stage. 2015, they were under the stage <laughs> in support of President Ramaitri Palasiri said. Indeed. Uh, the other, other fact is, uh, like, you have to put this bill to the parliament. How confident are you that this will get the traction you need? Know that my, this is a duty. Whether it's been passed or not, it is up to the parliament, as you are aware, that we'll have to get two-thirds in the parliament to pass this one. There has to be, because everybody has seen uh, what is the reason for this deterioration of the entire system. But nobody takes any steps to correct it. Now, I, it is not my position that this, this is the only way that you must resolve this one. But this has to be resolved. There must be some remedy. What the remedial issue measures must be decided by the legislature. 
In fact, that my personal use that this is not the best remedy. The best remedy we must go back to electoral system. And you look at Mahisha that Sri Lanka is the only country where we are having two types of electoral system now. Indeed. We, we we've been, been discussing about this yeah. uh, you know, on, on this program, uh, you know, what a uh, jumble we made out of. Real jumble. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to uh, connect two systems, two systems. and uh, then uh, we are now talking about the 21st amendment to the constitution which you know obviously you can but we are now uh, talking like drastic changes every single time yeah uh, so it's very much understood um, so uh, what is the process uh, we are heading for another uh, general election possibly uh, late April early May um, you want this passed before that so you want that uh, this particular bill in place to face that particular general election? That is my preference, but it is not practical. It is not possible. Now, in, if you look at that the local government election, we, we drafted a nice bill and a good system. What happened? These minority political parties, they interfered at the committee stage. Even people didn't get a chance to contest in the mm -hmm. challenge in the courts also, because this is after the court proceedings. At the committee stage, the minority political parties pressure, pressurized the Prime Minister, then he agreed for everything. Now what has happened? Instead of 4,800 local government members, now it has gone up to over 8,000. Mm -hmm. Most of the local authorities that they can run because their revenue is not good enough to maintain the members. And you look at the uh, provincial council election. That had been deprived by whom? by the minority political parties, including the JVP, that we drafted a nice bill in that also. Then they wanted to, they, some people challenge it in the Supreme Court. Then the Supreme, after the clearance of the Supreme Court, they went for a drastic changes at the committee stage, disregarding the Supreme Court. It, in fact, it's a contempt because that uh, humiliated the judgment of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And who did it? minority political parties, especially JVP, Muslim Congress, TNA. They are the people who got the Prime Minister to uh, jumble the whole thing. As a result, what they have done? They, have deep, they, have, they are responsible for the deprivation of the election for the entire nation. Now, more than two years after the last, you know, the dissolution of the last uh, provincial council, some of the provincial council, more than four years, no election. And they are talking about the democracy. What is this democracy? For the democracy, for the, not only for the minors, for anybody to survive in a, in a country, in a society, you must, you must have a government. If you, if you are going to look after the minority communities by disregarding the governance, the whole country will be in anarchy. Is there any country like that? Indeed. Uh, we've seen that for the past four or five years, what we've seen is that uh, issues uh, pertaining to the Muslim communities, the Tamil community is not addressed because apparently the, these uh, minority parties are taking the lead in trying to uh, broker some kind of a deal and at the end of the day it's always based on the fact that what they really want. I am, I am not hesitated to say that all these political parties, most of the times, I don't say every time, most of the times, they, they do a lot of deals just because they, just before the election that they get the money from the party where they are in and promise that they are not going. Two weeks before the election, they get a bigger amount from the other party and they just jump. Yeah, we've seen. As a result that the entire, you know, this, that, uh, the benefits to be flow, flow, flow down towards the general public in their communities and the political leaders are getting the benefit. Indeed. Uh, I want to talk about, more about uh, the political climate right now uh, within the country, but uh, before that, uh, I want to take a short commercial break. Uh, this is Get Real. I'm in conversation with Dr. Mujit Nasaraj Paksa. Stay with us. Uh, to get real, I'm in conversation with Dr. Vijayadasa Rajapaksa. Uh, we've been talking about the issues pertaining to the constitution and the amendments that have been 
you know, coming over and over again. Now we are proposing the 21st and the 22nd. In your uh, legal opinion, do you think, like, even uh, on the throne speech of President Gautambi Rajpaksa, he said that uh, people have lost confidence in the parliament and in the constitution. And they say, he said that if we want to actually address the issues of the people, we may have to rethink the constitution. Do you, are you in the same position? Do you think we need a new constitution? Long ago, that, you know, that I was agitating for it. In fact, that these amendments were not uh, just presented to the parliament. These amendments were presented in July last year, even before the, before the candidates of the presidential elections were, you know, the decided. Because we need it. We'll have to go for constitutional reforms, otherwise that we cannot go forward. One thing that we, first thing that we must have a strong parliament. Well, well stabilize parliament uh, to rule this country. The secondly, that you need the people, the, as representatives of the people, uh, who are, you know, conversant with, that's the politics. Well educated, professionals, and also that, that education is meaningless in politics unless that you are patriotic to your people and the country. Very much. Yes. Very much. Uh, talking about professionals, I want to get your reaction to what's happening right now in the country. Uh, parliamentarian Ranjan Ramanayaka's audio, uh, we've seen uh, he has been literary. <laughs> Perhaps there must be conversations <laughs> with you as well. But um, what I'm saying is um, what this brings out to the limelight is the real oh. side of dirty politics, uh, which I mean, people who actually stood up for the Yahapalne government is now in shock to find themselves in this particular uh, scenario where, you know, they've been ridiculed, uh, their support and their loyalty has been put into, you know, the gutter. So, um, but it is at the end of the day is a personal conversation. Uh, what, what, what is the legal ramification? What oh, can, so can be done? First thing, it is a shame for whole country. To have Indeed. people like that in our parliament. parliament. And the leaders who have brought him there must be more wow. shameful. Now, most of the people are that just talking about that he has done a dirty thing and dirty politics and he has ridiculed the judicial system. But there are, you know, the rigorous repercussions of these things. The people who have been convicted by those particular judges. Now, they, they have started thinking, how can this judge deliver a judgment convicting myself, mm -hmm. sentence him to the death, or for 10 years rigorous imprisonment? What is the credibility of this particular judge? Therefore, the whole nation today is thinking, what is the credibility? Because the court system is not depending on, basically, you know, it is, it is, it is not really based on the law. The law is there for the administration of justice. But the system is depending on the trust. Indeed. That if you, if you have no trust in the judiciary system, that the, this country will be a really an anarchy country because last so many decades that we survived, not because all the time we had the people had the confidence on the executive or the legislature. Most the of the system. time they didn't have. But because of the confidence we had, people have reposed in the judiciary. Now that is, has been lost. Unless we restore it, that there will be serious repercussions. How, how can we do that? One thing, one thing, Mahisha, that no media is talking. All are talking about that is gossip and yarns, all the dirty words that he is uttering. But no media is talking about that. How did he get that authority? Who gave him that authority to dictate the judges? So and so must be sent to the jail, so, must, so and so must be, you know, the, the acquitted and the other person to be convicted. Indeed. And you must put such and such people into the prison. He just a, he's the, he's a, just a deputy minister. Yes. He, he seems what to be is like his authority? Exactly. He's a puppet. He's who's a puppet. The pu who's the puppet master? That is the problem, that nobody is asking who gave that power. That the powers that be in that government has made use this puppet to uh, ridicule the entire system. 
if if we go dismantle the system if we go on that line of thinking what you say is the fact that we may get rid of ranjan ramanayaka through whatever the legal means but yeah. the real real perpetrators who Still actually they, uh, they are saint the saint they are in the society they are like saint the whole will put the blame finally on ranjan ramanayaka then he will be de destroyed in politically yes but is it the cause that is only you know that that is only the features of the uh, of the sickness but the diagnosis cause is somewhere else you have to remove that do you think we have the ability or the uh, legality uh, to go after the real puppet masters i mean do we think we are capable certainly you can you can but of course that you will have to get some evidence you can't on suspicion you can't you know that uh, uh, litigate against anybody mere suspicion won't do but you will have to get some material whether we will be able to get such material is a question sometimes sometimes he might confess <laughs> nobody knows <laughs> yes then we will see another complete uh, <laughs> different story <laughs> story um the other thing that i want to discuss with you um, doctor is um, the hamad report uh, you've been very vocal about that as well uh, when uh, the new president came in uh, into power you said that apparently we need to take this back what's your thinking behind that why do you, why do you say that i i have the hope that uh, the the thinking pattern of the present president and myself is you know, no different that uh, he he doesn't want you know our these are our, our national resources now there is a saying that uh, our our parents and grandparents that you know they have saved this all these things for us but they are not really our our inheritance this inheritance of the future nation therefore the it is the duty of the present rulers to preserve them that is that is what you know you know that's uh, arahan mahinda when mm -hmm. he came to uh, the mean that yes. his first preaching you know that international court has recognized that is the best uh, definition about the modern democracy what had been preached 2000 2300 years ago in anuradhapura mm -hmm. therefore that's any any political leader whoever who comes to the power that he is it is his duty he must protect the people and the resources of the country and of course that since it has gone too far that present president cannot just you know take over what had been given on a contract but he will definitely negotiate uh not only a mere resource you forget about that the commercial value of it but it has a greater risk that hambantota that sea line is the gateway just connecting our region our it's is part of asian the region one uh, the one china road uh, initiative not well. because of that the china that is in our, uh, all our that asian countries on this side and only through this gate you can have you can enter into the into uh, middle east europe africa that all the continents and therefore in a in a turbulence period in the world that this is the one of the most important strategic place that is why the china government was so keen and that is why america you you countries india japan all were annoyed by doing this one you know sometimes that uh, it was good that the president has informed point blank that uh, mcc that he is not, uh, not ready to sign it if the last government remain up to now that they should have definitely signed that mcc and so far then by the time that this should have been our country should have been the military base of us to attack uh, iran. iran indeed uh, i think the people of this country are fortunate that we got a president that who is fond of the country and the people that we prevented that situation but still that there is a certain amount of risk uh, because that uh, no country in our region has been exposed to such a danger uh, the way that we have invited ourselves for that such a danger mm -hmm. by giving it to a 
a company owned by the Chinese government who is trying to compete, who is competing with uh, the superpower of the world. That there is a, you know, cold war going on. And therefore that our, you have put our people, the entire nation, in a danger by signing that uh, Ambandar Agreement. The uh, one final question that I want to ask you about the fact that uh, when we go in for uh, the general election, um, it seems that there is a high possibility that we will see a Sri Lanka Potujana Peramuna um, government, um, a majority government, hopefully, uh, so that it would it could they could stabilize uh, the parliamentary process. Uh, are you contesting through them, or how how exactly would you be proceeding? Yes, definitely, because that uh, I thought that I must not uh, come from the national list. I will contest. And from where uh, will you be contested? I, I don't mind anywhere. <laughs> that I told that, uh, in fact, that uh, the president and the prime minister said that for me to select whatever the area that I want to contest. Indeed. Uh, so what I was... I have not finally decided that we will discuss and I don't mind any part of the country. country. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was the fact that uh, there, during the past four or five um, years, what we saw was revengeful politics. Uh, one that is against one particular family. That's why we did not see the development of the Hambantota uh, International Airport, which I, 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 my personal opinion is actually a gem which we could have actually got so much uh, to the country back, the Hambantota Port, and there were other, other areas, like even the, the Hambantota um, Cricket Stadium. Uh, these were actually built to world-class standards and mm -hmm. was not utilized. What is the plan? in a future SLPP government which you are going to be part of? You know that uh, President has already advised the police that don't go for any the revenge activities, that you must do a fair job. In fact, that in the last government that I was fighting alone, I didn't want this kind of, you know, the revenge politics. This vituperative politics has ruined this country that there must be stopped. In fact, that I was mercilessly attacked by most of these most of the powerful uh, politicians in the last government, that is because that I did not want them to interfere into the judiciary and the attorney general department. Mm -hmm. That is why I have been attacked. And they thought that by throwing me out of the cabinet, that they can, that is what they said openly in the meetings. Some of the ministers in the, mm -hmm. in, you know, open meetings, uh, rallies, they said that if I am removed from the Minister of Justice, that they will guarantee they will run up to 2025. Some ministers said that. They thought that by removing me that all the problems are sorted out. It was not so. It was not so because this uh, dirty politics will not be, you know, approved by the people anymore. Now people are rather educated and they know now what are the politics means. Also, they know who are the pol who are, who are the, the type of the politicians uh, in this country, and therefore that you cannot continue like that that kind of uh, dirty politics. I think that people will take a very wise decision in this election in selecting the people and by giving more powers uh, to the present president and the LPP, SLP, SLPP, SLPP, because the people also know that we have to go for radical reforms, including the constitutional amendments. Uh, I am quite confident that the people will, uh, will give that mandate for this government to continue with that successful and meaningful reforms. Indeed, uh, Dr. Vijayadas Rajapaksha, um, that's a very good point to stop our conversation for today. But. Uh, Hopefully a future minister, and when you become a minister, don't be uh, a stranger, come and talk to us as well. Uh, I want to thank you uh, personally uh, for accepting our invitation and coming on the program. Thank you very much for being and uh, sharing your ideas about the 21st and the 22nd Amendment. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'll be back on the other side with my closing arguments. Stay with us. Well, I hope the discussion gave you some vital points to ponder upon. The argument is very simple. What the parliamentarian, through his bill, asked in the House is, let's forget the communal politics we've been practicing so far and return to mainstream politics where our ideology is what differentiates us.
and not the color of our skin, the religion we practice and whatnot. What's so wrong with that? If the people of this country wants peace and harmony and wants each and every community to flourish and for us to celebrate reconciliation, then we, as the people, need to reject communal politics. We cannot continue to vote based on religion or ethnicities. That's just nonsense. If we want a united Sri Lanka, then what we need is a united political front. The ideologies of governance should be the only thing that different and not anything else. We as people should push our leaders to change. They are the ones who have been dividing all of us for decades. And now we are slowly understanding this. Not only understanding this, but we are taking action. Think about that in the upcoming general election. We should put aside parties that represent religion and ethnicities and only embrace or support the ones that honestly brings everyone together and represents each and every one of us. That should be the one, uh, one of the criteria for us to look for as we decide on our future. Now tonight I want to leave you with a quote from Kathy Birmingham Martin, an American author, who said, and I quote, When we fail to be tolerant of others, we fail as a nation. That's our show for tonight. I'm Mahesh Johnny. From all of us here at Other Dharana 24 and the Get Real team, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Good night.